So this is um, about making change stick. And it's something that I have become increasingly interested in and perhaps even a little bit obsessed by in recent years because I've come to realize um, that this is, to my mind at least, like the most important thing that anybody should be thinking about in education and indeed in the wider society, the implementation of of, of good ideas, <laughs> making the world a better place, so to speak. It seems pretty self-evident, um, but there's a, there's a huge gap in 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 the the training that, that teachers and school leaders and others are um, exposed to as they as they um, you know are inducted into these roles. People aren't taught how to implement change effectively bluntly and and i know that partly because i used to used to be my job to facilitate the mpqs the, the qualifications that school leaders do and i was also part of the team at ucl who was tasked with with um writing the new ones and and there's some stuff in there on implementation but it's not where it's at to my mind and we're, we're still not teaching people these really powerful important ideas um and so that's what this program does. And, and I, I came across implementation science a few years ago now, and it just blew my mind. And I started to read about it and to, to hoover up everything that I could find um, about, about change management from, from the education literature, but also from healthcare and from business. And the world of change management, the literature on change management is uh, quite vast. But it's also quite laden with jargon. There's a huge lang language problem in this area. Um, and there's also lots of very bewildering diagrams with little light bulbs and cogs and feedback loops and boxes and arrows and, and every sort of visual metaphor that you can imagine. And it's all quite overwhelming. Um, and it's not that, that much fun, frankly, to read lots of the change management literature. But there are loads and loads of really fantastic ideas out there. And we, we sort of, it's like we know how to make the world a better place. We just aren't doing it in a systematic way yet. And so that's what this program has done over the last few years. I've sort of trawled the, the, the literature on this stuff. And, I, and I, we, I ran the first pilot of this program five years ago. Uh, and it had an amazing impact at the school that we piloted it at. And now I've run this training with thousands of schools all over the world. And uh, we're running a big uh, pilot in Wales at the moment. We'll hear some, some from some of the people from Wales in a short while. Um, and, and it just goes down so well with people. The, like, the feedback that we get on this program is unbelievable. It's like unusually positive. Like people are saying like, oh, this has been the making of me as a leader. I really wish I'd known this years ago. I want this to be my legacy to the school in 20 years from now. This is not normal feedback. <laughs> As somebody who's been training teachers for a long time, there's something there's something here that's really special, I think, and it's very exciting space to be working in. So the 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 basic gist of this is going to be that I want this to be a really interactive session. I'm going to speak for as, as short a time as I can at the at the outset, just to give you a brief introduction to this stuff, to some big ideas. Number one, the, the trouble with top down change, which I think is why partly why the world is the way that it is because we default to top-down change and and that often isn't the best way of doing things i'm going to talk about a really powerful idea the the big idea really that drives this whole approach this idea of the vertical size team and then we'll get into being interactive and you can explore the toolkit and ask me anything about it it usually takes 24 hours to complete this this program like eight three-hour sessions or 12 two-hour sessions that are usually spread over like a six-month period and so we don't have obviously time to, to cover everything today, um, but this this will be an opportunity for you to interrogate the toolkit and to figure out, you know, to take away from this session whatever whatever you think will be useful. And then we'll have a bit of a Q and A at the end. So I'm going to start by asking you a question. So this is a question that I often ask to people when I start these the, the, this process. If you had to put a number on it, as you look back over your career. What proportion of school improvement initiatives would you say actually improve anything? Interesting. Some people straight off the bat, 10%, 30%, 15, 10. Ooh, I want to talk to you, the Tillian partnership. Like, I'd love to hear that. Historically, 15% and now 80. Um, that sounds interesting. 
Would you mind to just like put a little bit of detail on that in the chat so that I can get more of a sense of what you're, what you're talking about there? Really appreciate that. Um, the rest of them, is, it's really interesting. Whenever I ask this question, I almost always get the exact same range, right? Somewhere around the 10 to 20% mark, usually. So like one in, one in five, one in six, one in seven, something like that, change initiatives that actually improve things. So we're going to, we're going to tighten the criteria a little now. As you look back over your career, that same question, what proportion of change initiatives would you say, number one, led to significant demonstrably improved outcomes? So you've got, you've got evidence for, for what got better. Secondly, you've got a strong sense of causation. So you've got a sense of what it is that you did that led to those outcomes, or perhaps what it is that you stopped doing that led to those outcomes. And thirdly, those improvements were sustained over several years and are still happening now. So as you look at those three criteria, can you, can you enter another number into the chat box? Has your number stayed the same? Has it gone up? Has it gone down? Interesting. So, so, so a few people are saying that it's, it's gone down, right? Like there's, a, there's a couple of zero percents there. There's a 5%. That's not good, is it? If people are saying 0% or 5%, you know, that's not good, you know, there's, there's, and there's no shortage of change initiatives happening, are there? As, as a former teacher, it sometimes felt like the only constant was constant change. Um, and if you scale this up across the, the country, you know, if there's 30,000 schools in this country, an estimated 5 million schools across the planet, and they're all implementing at least one, maybe two or three change initiatives a year, that's a, a, a huge amount of time that we're spending implementing change initiatives taking up all the lots of people's time and energy and so on and effort and very little of it is actually leading to those improvements and so you can see here can't you there's a very strong case already for for um why we need to focus on implementation science and it's not just based on this is, this is an example of a teacher survey i suppose um, um but also if we ask experts in change management if we look at the available research evidence, it all points in the same direction. We're not good at this stuff yet. We're not good at implementing change effectively. And there's a I know this is a bit of a this is a bit of a PowerPoint faux pas, but I'm not going to read it out. I'll just give you a moment to glance down the screen and look at this fantastic, interesting quote from Anthony Brake and colleagues. Who, uh, he's a world-renowned expert in change management. He's based in the states. I'll just give you a moment to read that. This is something that, um, I mean, they really nail it here, don't they? I mean, I, I, I certainly recognize that pattern. Enthusiasm wanes um, and the, the, the pattern is implement fast. Everything's sort of done in a hurry. Uh, learn slow and burn goodwill as you go. And that's the thing, isn't it? It does burn goodwill when you work in this way. Um, and this is not something that's unique to education. So in healthcare, people have been really interested for a long time to, to, to discover to what extent is what we know to be best practice actually happening out in the world? Um, and the, the, the research on this is, is really alarming. Um, it's the, the, the research in this area where people have looked at a wide range of health disciplines in a wide range of settings, we find that on average, it takes 17 years for a piece of what we know to be gold standard you know, best practice to achieve 14 1.4% uptake across the system as a whole, which is obviously terrible, right? 17 years, 14%. These are both bad numbers. And so one of the questions that people have said is like, how can we improve this, this situation? Um, and, and we'll come back to that in a moment. But first, I want to alight on this question. Why is this success rate so low? I've already intimated at it. It's this guy, the top-down monster. Um, and there's a number of problems with top-down change, and that in itself is a problem because top-down change, as I mentioned, is our go-to model in schools, in hospitals, in governments, in businesses. We have a small number of people at the top of the organization who make decisions on everybody else's behalf and, and just then sort of announce what's going to happen. And top-down change can be effective in some circumstances when swift, decisive action is called for. But when it comes to complex, multi-layered things like closing the disadvantage gap or improving whole school behavior or changing the way that we do feedback or whatever it might be, or we might think of wider societal problems, top-down change 
is hopelessly ineffective for a number of reasons. One being that the people at the top of the system are often not in post for long enough to really see change through. The average, the average um, um, incumbency of a cabinet minister in this country is 1.3 years. And that, I think that that number's probably come down in the last year because it's been a bit of a revolving door up there, hasn't there? Um, and each person comes into office, and this happens in schools as well. They want to make their mark. They want to have their flagship policy that they will be known for. This is their legacy thing. And then they move on quite quickly. And we know that it takes three to five years to implement change effectively in schools. But people often aren't in post for that long. And so they, they move on to another school or they get promoted or they get put on a different, a different responsibility. And then everything that they were doing kind of quietly collapses behind them. And this leads to a phenomenon that goes by many names, initiative-itis, innovation fatigue, or this too shall pass syndrome, this phrase that teachers sometimes mutter under their breaths as the latest wheeze is announced. Um, and this is a really, really big problem. Initiative-itis is very corrosive, um, really problematic. Secondly, human nature. You know, people don't like being told what to do. Um, and this, this becomes apparent from a very young age when, when you say to, to a young child, like, let me put your shoes on for you. And they go, no, me do it. You know that phenomenon. They just, like, they just want to do it. And this persists long into adulthood. We know that in, the, in workplace research that people value autonomy more than they value how much they get paid. After a certain pay point, people just want to have a small amount of say over what they do and when and how. And top-down change, like my way or the highway, strong-arm leadership, sort of robs people of that the, the ability to have that deep human need met. And thirdly, groupthink is the mother of all problems with top-down change. When you have a small number of people who are making decisions together, especially when they're all like-minded, like cabinet ministers are all basically the same types of people, aren't they? They're all cabinet ministers. Senior leaders are all very similar types of people. Um, and with the best will in the world, with, with very smart people in the room, you often get bad decision making when you have small groups of like minded people making decisions together. And groupthink has been responsible for huge problems over the years from space shuttle disasters and airplane crashes to the financial crash of 2008. Lots of groupthink and evidence during the COVID pandemic as well. And this is a huge problem. And so th there's, there's a number of problems. I could talk about this all day, but we'll, we'll pause it there for now. There are a number of problems with top-down change. And the solution, as far as I can see, and this is what we found in the healthcare literature and in my last five years of working in this space in schools, is to use a vertical slice team where you take a cross-section through the organization and you get representatives of different types of people, different stakeholder groups, if you like, sitting around the decision-making table together, not just as a consultation exercise, but that, that, that vertical slice team actually becomes the executive that's tasked with overseeing this particular aspect of school improvement. And this has been tried and tested in healthcare. And we find that when you work in this way, you can achieve 80% uptake of best practice within three years. And that, that, that's the, those, those figures come from a book. Dean Fixon is a leading scholar in implementation science. If you like, I can send you the, 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 re the research that sits behind that finding. And that's astonishing, isn't it? If we can, if we can move from 14% from, from in 17 years to 80% in three years, if we can figure out how to bottle that, how to import these ideas into, into education, then we're really gonna be onto something in terms of improving outcomes for kids across the planet. Um, and, and there's more to implementation science than just this idea of a vertical slice team, as we'll see. But this is really the big idea that, that drives, this, drives this whole approach. Um, and this, is, this was seen, um, there's a good example of this from, from healthcare at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. They had real problems with, with very high levels of, of hospital admissions due to asthma. And so they assembled a vertical slice that included you know, senior clinicians from the hospital, but also included people like school nurses and pharmacists and the you know, like asthma patients themselves and their families. And they put this team together and then they look at this problem from multiple perspectives. And wherever you find a problem, you just fix that problem and move on. So for example, the school nurses would say, the, the, the kids are really forgetful. They're always leaving their medication at home. So they're like, right, we'll make sure that there's always a stock of Ventolin available in school. And the pharmacists would say, you know, people are forgetful. They don't take, you know, they don't come in, I beg your pardon, they don't say they're forgetful. They often said things like they, 
they don't come and pick up their prescriptions, right? Because they don't have a car, because they work long hours. And so they're like, okay, so we'll go and deliver prescriptions to people's houses and so on. And the, the patients themselves were saying that we've got damp and mold in my home and the landlord won't do anything about it. And so they provided legal aid to take on the landlords. And so wherever they found problems, they figured out a creative solution to that problem. And within five years of, of, of administering this, this vertical size team, hospital admissions due to uh, asthma had reduced by 50%. The readmission rate had, had reduced by a further 50% in the following three years. Huge reductions in school days missed, in workplace absenteeism. Excuse the MCS stuff there. That's just a, a find and replace error. And huge financial savings as well for the hospitals. So this is a win, 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 win situation. Like it's such a good idea. It saves money, improves outcomes. There's no downside here. It's a very powerful thing. And yet this is this is the this is still the minority. Like this, this stuff is happening, but it's the exception rather than the rule. And so what we want to do is just figure out how we can beef this up. And so in schools, the, the schools that I've been working with, we assemble a vertical slice, including some or all of the people who we see on the on the on the screen here it depends on the size of the school as to how many people you have in your in your um, team if you're in primary it's a good idea to have a cross section of different phases if you're in secondary a cross section of different subjects and so on sometimes we include young people in these groups parents governors whoever has a valuable perspective on the problem that you're trying to solve um and we come up with a set of ground rules to counter that group think that we were talking about earlier um, we have a, ground, a set of ground rules. For example, everyone's an equal member of this team. So al although the name vertical slice implies a hierarchy, and of course there is a hierarchy in place, around this table, everybody's an equal member and we're equally responsible for writing to and for executing this plan over a period of, of often about three to five years. We make sure that all relevant information is shared, especially inconvenient information if you if you if you feel like you think actually this isn't such a good idea you need to say that and you need to be able to say that without fear of repercussion to air your honest views without fear of repercussion and with that in mind you also need to be prepared to have your own views challenged where appropriate if we're going to be having these these robust dec decisions bearing in mind that we need to work towards agreement here we need to be solution focused and lastly, when we're having these robust conversations where we're often mentioning particular colleagues or, or pupils or families by name, the usual clause around confidentiality arises. And we find that when you work in this way and when you set up this set of ground rules, you people really rise to it and they go, oh, this is different. We can actually say what we really think here and we're going to have the robust discussions that you need to have when you're making decisions that affect many people's lives. And one way that we do this, this is a, a, almost the final thing that I'll say on this. Before we open up um, to a more interactive part of this session. One of the ways that we have these robust discussions is that we come up with a set of five minute interviews. So you come up with a bunch of questions like, let's say it's a feedback intervention and you say, OK, so what do you think about this feedback idea? Do you agree that this is a priority for the school at this point in time? What questions do you have? What concerns or ideas do you have? And then the different members of that vertical slice team go and talk to other people like them, right? So the middle leader goes and talks to other middle leaders just for five minutes. They sit down and have a coffee and ask them these questions. The teaching assistant talks to other teaching assistants and so on. And then they bring that information back the next time the vertical slice team meets, but they anonymize the feedback. So they don't say, you know, Arabella thinks this is a load of rubbish. They say, actually, you know, people are concerned about this aspect of what we're doing, or people don't think that this is a priority at this point in time. We really need to nail behavior before we need to think about feed feedback and what have you. Um, and you, you, they, they can roll in their own views with, with that anonymized data. And so there's a, the, we can come up with safe ways for people to have these robust exchanges of views. And the, the, the senior leaders that I work with often say that once you've worked in this way, there's no going back because you really get a strong sense that you know what it is that people are thinking and feeling throughout the school community. And why this, why this approach works, number one, you get better policy because you've looked at this problem from multiple perspectives. You just get much better decision making to begin with. Secondly, people throughout the community know that they're represented on this change team. There's somebody like them with whom they can interact throughout the change period. And so you get buy in like never before you get you harness all of this goodwill and energy and enthusiasm for people from throughout the, the community. 
who then sort of want to co-own the change and drive it through with you rather than just sort of wanting to be seen to be compliant with the latest, you know, diktat. And thirdly, it works with the grain of human nature rather than against it, giving people a voice and a choice. And that's the best antidote to groupthink that there is. And so this is just one of the ideas in this toolkit. As you can see, the toolkit falls into three phases, preparing the ground, which is about sort of setting the ground, thinking about the role of school leaders, how to choose an area of focus. And then the meat of the program, as you can see, is in the middle here in, under implementation planning. And the first thing is to assemble a vertical slice team. And then we work our way through a series of, of activities and processes culminating in chapter 18 here, the implementation plan, which is a very robust um, you know, three to five year plan. Then we do a pre-mortem, where a really interesting exercise where you think, okay, let's imagine ourselves three years from now, this plan, as brilliant as it is, has not worked. What are all the ways in which this is going to go wrong? People are really good at coming up with a long list of reasons that things aren't going to work. And then you go, okay, let's just rewind to the present moment. We'll anticipate those problems in advance and we'll, we'll make contingencies for them. And often it's just things that you can predict, like staff turnover. You know, if you've got 10% turnover a year, which is about the average, then five years from now, you've got half the staff are going to be different. You need to have a plan in place. Like turnover is the enemy of progress, but you can overcome that problem really easily with, like, with, well, with well thought through onboarding um, procedures and what have you. So we work our way through this, making this implementation plan, and then we project manage it essentially, and we move into the making it happen phase on the right-hand side. And this is the menu slide that you'll be able to interrogate shortly. And so I've created this toolkit, as I say, um, I'm, I'm gonna skip over the implementation equation. This is it's essentially a way of saying that everything in this thing is important. What times how equals wow, right? What you do and how you do it equals improved outcomes. And if you like, there's a little multiplication sign between each of the things on this on this slide. If you overlook any one of these things, you might well end up with a, with a zero outcome. And so you, we can't take any shortcuts here. You have to, you know, it's a very front loaded program. You, the, you can't fast forward it. You have to look at this in a really meticulous way if you really want to improve those outcomes. But when you do, the evidence is coming in now that this is really reaping dividends. And so there's a program um, that's, uh, that, that, as well as doing this like, facilitated, there's an online program if you're interested, which is a much more cost effective way of doing this training. There's a free taster course um, if you want to get more of a sense of what's in this thing. Um, there's a bunch of free resources on that website, makingchangestick.co. There's, there's some video testimonials and FAQs and what have you. Um, and at the moment, I'll, I'll share this with you and then we'll have a bit of a chat and then we'll, we'll move to the interactive session. Um, at the moment, we're doing this national pilot in Wales, 10 schools um, across Wales um, who are running this over a six month period. And, and that, that trial concludes this month. And the, it's going very well from what we can see so far. Um, and the idea is that the Welsh government will then, or the, the, there's an organisation called the NAEL, the National Academy for Educational Leadership, will um, hopefully, if, if this goes according to plan, will then endorse it to all the schools in Wales. And I would just like to share with you some of the comments that people have made upon completing this program, because it's it's something else. So um, if you bear with me a second, I will just turn my volume up um, so you can hear this. This is just a two minute clip um, over, over to, to Kat. I came into the training very cold for implementation pilot, so I didn't know anything at all about it. And I think for me, the way that the program was structured on the day was really helpful. Those sort of short, snappy, looking at different elements of the playbook and making myself reflect on my own learning and my own school was really helpful. I think in the implementation program has really been the making of me leader. Um, there were many I had about change management throughout, you know, but rarely was I given the opportunity to actually be shown and guided through them and I think it's something that I take with me now and, and apply to, to everything that I do so not I manage to make that policy so much better but, but I've also developed the skill set to lead other changes through and the, the really nice thing is I've been able to coach other people in implementation science so it's having a wider impact on our school culture. Senior leadership teams often sit around the table make decisions and then impose those decisions 
for want of a better word, on the rest of the staff at having real staff voice. And uh, we started to do elements of this, but having real staff voice makes a huge difference. I would definitely recommend this training to other schools. Um, I think for me, it's about looking ahead. It's about moving away from seeing school improvement as these little boxes that we do every year and fit neatly into academic years and actually thinking about something long term thinking about how do we actually make strategic change to fix and I'm envious of those who are at the beginning of their career and have something like this that day was a game changer for me and what's the great thing it's going to make a difference for my learners and you know ultimately that's that's what you want and it will it without it you know I've been around long enough there's you know things that come in and go in this I think hopefully I hope this will be my legacy to the school that you know if I've done nothing else for them I hope this is what they'll thank me for in 20 years time so um hopefully you're persuaded that there's that there's something in this that is not normal feedback that there's not normal feedback um, in my experience. There's, there, there, people are saying unusual things about this program. And so um, this is the bit where we're going to, where we're, I'm going to give you the opportunity to, to interrogate this toolkit. And if there are any of these ideas that you would like to, to know more about, we're about halfway through the hour. And so we've got a good chunk of time now to, to investigate um, some of these ideas. Um, so if anybody has any, any um, requests um, for something that you'd like to hear more about, please stick it in the chat window um, and we will, I'll, I'll follow your lead. Okay, great stuff, thank you. So we have tight but loose, uh, Gusky's pyramid, an example of implementation planning. That's an interesting one. Thank you, Karen. I, um, I, I'll have a think about that. I, I can definitely talk, walk you through the implementation plan. Um, I don't know if I can share with you an actual plan in this session, but I will, I will give that some thought. Um, thank you. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, um, Gusky's pyramid and implementation planning. So um, let's go. So tight but loose, first of all, um, is this idea that's been uh, written about very well by Dylan William and his colleagues, um, as as with many things. Um, and Dylan and and um, and uh, sorry, I beg your pardon, Thompson and William, two thousand and eight. So it's a while ago. This paper, they started talking about the tight but loose formulation in re in relation to assessment for learning. And they said that the tight but loose formulation combines an obsessive adherence to central design principles, the tight bit, with accommodations. It's a bit of a word, mouthy word for this quote, but you, you'll see what it, why it's useful in a moment. With accommodations to the needs, resources, constraints, and particularities that occur in any school or district, the loose part, but only where these do not conflict with the theory of action of the intervention. And essentially, it's a way of recognizing that um, in, in, in implementation, there's this, there's this word called fidelity. You often hear this word fidelity, and it basically means like copying accuracy, as though, like, as, the way, as though the way to implement change is just to get everybody to be very sort of like identical little clones to, to accurately copy whatever the original idea was. And that doesn't work because that's not really how people work, going back to that whole thing about autonomy and agency and, and ad adapting ideas at the point of use. And so you need to be a bit flexible, just like top-down fidelity isn't the way to go. But equally, if you're too loose, then you might end up with what's sometimes referred to as a lethal mutation, where the thing has, has sort of changed so much from the original idea that you've actually killed the effective, you know, that, that final phrase, you've come into conflict with the theory of action of what it is that you're trying to do. And so tight but loose is essentially about trying to straddle these two errors of being too, too rigid and too, too loose. Um, and so it's a, it's a matter of, of overcoming the, sorry, this is just a slide that explains about a lethal mutation. So it's a matter of overcoming 
this the, this tendency to 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 err on either side of, of of this sort of this line that we need to walk and this in, it involves being really clear about the direction of travel so for example if if all teachers if there's a, if there's a whole school expectation that all teachers need to have a do now task or a starter task on the board that's great um but you know like maybe maybe there's a way to maybe there's a way to loosen that up so like the nature of the do now task is up to is up to the kids maybe there's a menu of things that the kids can choose from so that they can do something that will get them into the groove or maybe we could say all pupils are expected to hand in their homework or it might be like we all need to improve our our practice with regard to feedback um but but you might i beg your pardon but you might say with with regard to those things you know the the nature of the homework which homework tasks you hand in and how long you spend on your homework is sort of we're going to let the kids have a little bit of agency here so that they can do stuff that's useful to them rather than just setting one task for all 30 kids and expecting that that's going to be the thing that's going to move all 30 kids forward. Likewise, if we all need to improve our practice with regard to feedback, that's a great thing to have as a whole school expectation. But you might say, well, you know, like some, some of us can look at the timing of feedback. Some of us can look at the nature of the feedback, the quality of the feedback. We we'll look at how long it is until the until they have to respond to the feedback and so on. So there are lots of different ways in which you can crack that that question open. So these are the tight components, and then the loose components are about essentially about empowering our colleagues to make smart decisions about how they will adapt what they're doing at the at the point of at the point of use, um, if that makes sense. So yeah, that's tight but loose. Does anybody have any questions about that? Does that was it you, Arabella, that asked for that one? Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I've got a thumbs up. Um, Gusky's pyramid um, is a really interesting one. Um, thank you for that, Darren. And so um, Gusky's pyramid is, is a, an idea that comes from the work of Thomas Gusky, a prolific education researcher from the states. And he talks about it initially as something that um, that we need to uh, to think about in terms of evaluating professional development. So he talks about it as five levels of evaluation, but it's really useful as an implementation tool as well. Um, and so he says that there are five levels at which we can evaluate professional learning, if you like. Number one is where we think about, excuse me one sec, about the initial reactions to a, to a professional development session. So let's say you've been in you know, a training session and this is like the A4 sheet that people hand out at the end of the day or at the end of the session. And you tick, you know, like on a scale of one to four, was the presenter knowledgeable? You know, was the room a good temperature or whatever it might be? You know, the, the, the basic levels of human needs, are they being met? Was it, did, did you learn something useful from that session and so on? Um, what are you going to change about your practice? And then at a level above that, we have participant learning. What did the participants in that session actually learn? What did they take away? And we know as teachers, don't we, that what is taught is not necessarily the same as what is learned, if only it were true. And this is the, this is the case for, for adult learning as well. And so you might want to evaluate that at that level as well. So it might be a little exit interview or an ex exit um, form that people fill out. Or it might be, you know, a day or two later, you survey people and ask them to what extent, you know, did they actually learn the same stuff here? It could just be a little one or two question survey to capture what people learned from that session. Um, next, we have organizational support for change. To what extent is the, is the organization actually set up for giving people the time, the space, the, the Wi-Fi connectivity, whatever it is that they need in order to implement this, this change effectively? And that's the one where these things most often fall over. Um, next, we have the actual implementation level. To what extent are people using this new knowledge and skills? And lastly, we have pupil outcomes, which we obviously want to improve. And what Guski says is that there, there are three things to take away from this. Number one, all of these five levels are really important and you can't afford to overlook any of them. And that's what people often do. They often think we, we can just skip straight from number one to number five. If we want everybody to do X, we'll, we'll have a twilight session. We'll tell everybody to do X and then all will be well and the pupils will improve without realizing that things can fall over at any number of steps along the way. Secondly, um, Guski says that these things are sequential, right? That you need, to, you need to have some sort of a shared learning experience in order for everybody to learn the same stuff. 
everybody needs to have learned the same stuff to make a strong and, and to agree that this is a good direction to go in in order to make a strong case for organizational support for change. All of that needs to be in place in order to actually implement this new knowledge and skills in, in an effective manner. And all of that needs to be happening in order to improve pupil outcomes. And then the third thing that Guski says is that in the planning process, you reverse the stages. So we talk about this elsewhere in the program as well, the importance of backwards design. So you start by thinking, what is the difference that we want to make for kids? What are the particular outcomes that we want to change? Is this about the disadvantage gap? Is it about reading? Is it about behavior? Is it about engagement, attendance, whatever? What is it that we want to change? And then we work backwards and think, what do we need to do differently? Or what do we need to do more of or less of as teachers, leaders, and support staff to bring about that change? Next, we think, what support do those colleagues need in order to bring about that change? Next, we think, what does everybody need to learn in order to make this happen? And finally, we think, okay, let's plan some sessions here. So that's, that's Gusky's pyramid. Um, do you have any questions on that, Darren, or anybody else? Okay, great, thank you. Um, and lastly, uh, actually, if I may, before we go to um, to the um, to to look at the implementation plan, because this will this will give me a moment to have a think about where I could might find one on my computer. Um, if you if you if you're interested, if you can, if you'd like to book a thirty minute call, if you're interested in this program, if you'd like to think through how it might work in your setting, there's a link here. Um, bit.ly forward slash book MCS, or if you scan that QR code, you can book in for a 30 minute um, call with myself and my colleague Katie um, to, to have a chat. So if you want to do that, well, just, just, just uh, I'll give you a minute to fill that out. Okay. So, um, Shall we look at some implementation planning? Um, the implementation plan um, is, a, is is quite a big document. It's about sort of thirty pages, but that's because there's only it's, it's designed to be really clean, so that there's only one really one idea on each page. Um, but it all boils down to a thing called the the logic model, which I'll share with you in a moment. Um, and so. Yeah, the, the, the logic model, to, to come back to, because you were asking about a summary, um, Karen, weren't you? Um, the logic model is just a, like a one-page breakdown as to as, that sets out your theory of action, what it is that you're going to do, how you're going to know it's been effective, how you're going to monitor and evaluate it over time, and so on. Um, you, so you start by looking at what are the unmet needs that we're, that we're currently trying to address for different groups of people within the school. How are we going to address those, those needs? Um, how, what are we going to do to actually implement that change? What are the short, medium, and long-term outcomes for teachers and for students? And how are we going to capture this, this process? And how are we going to use data in an ongoing way to, uh, to evaluate where we're going? And then the rest of the plan really sets out how each of these elements are going to be implemented and realized over this three to five year period. And so here's a, a, this snapshot um, of the, the logic model, which breaks down those different areas. And at this point, we can see how all of the ideas in this implementation program are sort of are, are the things that underpin this. So like the data collection exercise, that fight, those five minute interviews that I mentioned earlier, that's a part of the needs analysis. And we do other kinds of baseline data collection. We do a literature review. We look at the, that tight but loose thing that we saw earlier. There's a thing called diffusion of innovations, which is about how ideas spread through the organization. Um, I won't go through all of these now, but you can see that when we get to this, even though this is only a one page snapshot that we, that we write at the end of this process, we can see that it's underpinned by a huge amount of thinking. Um, and so it's a very, very sort of concentrated uh, piece of work and and this implementation th th this one page logic model is really shareable this is something that you can stick up on the staff room wall you can e email it to people you can have it as the background on your desktop so that you can remind yourself what it is that you're trying to do and where in this process you are um, and so that that's what a summary of this looks like um, if that answers your question um, and then the, the, like the other elements of the implementation plan you can see the different the different chapter headings um, if you glance down the screen there, 
communications is a, is a huge thing that's often overlooked in, in education, in, in business, in, in, in the charity sector, in politics, communications planning is really common. And often when I'm working with, with senior teams, they're like, we don't have a communications plan. And you need to really think about that. Like, I think that one of the reasons that things often fall over is essentially that people stop talking about them. And so with a communications plan, you sort of think about how you can conduct like a chorus of voices, different types of people who are communicating through different channels to different audience groups. And you just you calendar it and timetable it to make sure that this remains a live issue on people's sort of mental dashboards, if you like, um, as time goes on. And so, um, yeah, communications is really key. And monitoring and evaluation is the other really big one. Um, once once we've implemented this like once we've sort of reached day one of implementing change we collect data in an ongoing way and then we review that data we, we, we come back to things called pivot or persevere meetings where the team gets together to meet regularly as the data comes in looking at which aspects of, of what we're doing are working well which aspects maybe need to be tweaked and refined and, and retrialed and so on so you're continually this, this is an idea that comes from business the idea of agile leadership you're continually reviewing the evidence and sort of like reorienting yourself, if you like, towards the optimal way of doing whatever it is that you're doing. And so in theory, at least, this thing can't go wrong, right? Because you're recognizing that, you, you know, you've got these very clearly defined goals that you're working towards, and we're going to follow the data at every step along the way. And what we think the vehicle to get us from A to B is on day one, that vehicle might look very different a year or two or three from now, but we will have followed the data at every step along the way. Um, and so monitoring and evaluation and communication are two really real biggies. I'll just take a moment to read this question from Derry. Does change work best when implemented across a whole organization? Or is there a case for small scale pilots, e.g. a Kolbergian school within a school, adopting more democratic student directed learning mini schools uh, within a direction within a conventional direct teacher directed context? Really interesting question. And I, I know Derry, I interviewed Derry, for those of you who aren't familiar with him, brilliant, brilliant man who um, wrote a fantastic book um, called um, Another Way is Possible, Becoming a Democratic Teacher in a, st in, in a State School. And so Derry did a sort of a little school within a school project. And absolutely, Derry, there's a, there's a strong case for small scale pilots um, and, and for, for trialing things um and and you know like scaling them up i think another another really big common error with with the way that people implement change is that they just go right we've had this this you know flash of inspiration we all need to do this change and we're all going to do it on monday in unison just as one and we're all going to move forward like this like a like an army garrison or something and that's a ridiculous way of working and so you what you want to do instead is to think about about who are your colleagues and who's ready for change at this point in time and absolutely as you say start with a pilot get the early adopters on board the people who are going to able enable you to multiply your efforts rather than sort of working initially with the people who are really resistant to this idea you can be really transparent about that process and say you know some of you may feel resistant to this some of you might not be on board with it that's fine we will get to you, but they, you know, but maybe in year two or three, we'll we'll expect you to get on board with it. But first of all, we're going to focus on really establishing best practice among people who feel ready, willing, and able to to make this change now. Um, and so you can you can work your way through the organization in a very smart way instead of just thinking, right, everyone, we're doing this on Monday, and if you don't like it, there's the door. You know, that's just a non-starter. Um, so yes, is the short version of that. I think I'd like to share one idea with you that I think is an absolute corker, which not many people know about. And it's this idea of the implementation bridge. Um, and, then we'll, and then we'll wrap this up um, before five o'clock. The implementation bridge is such a powerful thing. Um, and this is based on some work from, from, from Jean Hall and Shirley Horde, two, two scholars, again, from the, from the States. Um, and they say that the way that you get from where you are to where you want to be, you can build a bridge, if you like, to get you from where you are to where you want to be. And they say that that bridge has three planks, if you like. Uh, there's one called stages of concern. And we'll look at these, these in a moment. Second one is called levels of use. And then the third one is called steps to success. 
Right. And so stages of concern is essentially like how concerned are people? How bothered are people about this thing currently? And it's a scale and it works from the bottom of the slide up to the top. And so people are initially um, concerned at the level of self, then they become concerned at the level of task and then at the level of impact. And so I won't read, read through this whole thing, but if you just glance your way up the screen, you get the idea as to what kinds of different levels of concern people can have. And you simply ask people to rate themselves on this scale. That's all you need to do. It's just to, like, um, you can turn this into a, into a simple, you know, one question survey. Um, where are you on this scale on a, on, the, on a point from one to seven? And, and, and it's sometimes people can be, you know, at two or three different points on this scale. They might think I'm partly at, you know, at um, level two and three and four. I'm sort of thinking all of those things simultaneously. And that's fine. So that's stages of concern. And then, so we're up at this point, we pause and we think, you know, like thinking about whatever it is that you're trying to do, think about where you are now and think about some other colleagues somewhere in the school, think about where they are likely to be now. And you can, as I say, be at several levels simultaneously. So that's stages of concern, that's our first plank. Then we have levels of use and levels of use is essentially about recognizing that somebody can be very concerned about something, without actually doing anything about it. And so levels of use um, is about saying, you know, the, the, to what extent are people walking the talk, as it were. So again, this is a scale that goes from the bottom of the slide to the top, from non-use, like is taking no action, all the way through to renewal, is thinking about even more effective ways to use this, you know, the, this particular type of practice. And again, you would pause at this point and think, you know, where are you at? Where's that colleague at in terms of what they're actually doing about this thing? And again, you can occupy multiple levels simultaneously. And just with those two questions, you can plot these responses on a graph. So let's say that you, let's say it's a, this is about a feedback intervention. And at the very start of this intervention, this change initiative, you might ask your colleagues to all fill out those two those two questions on a survey, and then you would plot their responses. And it might look something like this, 12 people are at the level of non-use and just basic awareness of this thing. And there's a bit of a random distribution there of people. There's a bit of a spread. And then you would you know, get those early adopters on board and you start to develop good practice. And then after a while, when you do this survey again later, you would expect to see a, a spread that looks a bit like this, where there are some people who are moving towards the high level of use and a high level of concern. And there are still some people who are right at the beginning of this process. And then you would think, oh, OK, so how can we get these people on the lower right hand side of the slide here? How can we get them to model this, to help to coach or mentor or instruct those people who are still struggling? And then three months later, we start to see even more of a migration down to the bottom right of the screen. And so this can be used as a very quick snapshot to get a sense of where the school is at and how this how this information how this project is is uh, changing over time. So that's the first two. Um, planks of our bridge and then the third one is called steps to success and this is my language um, Hall and Horde call it something different and here we have a five-point scale based like and this this is one that we come up with ourselves rather than using their scale so we have baseline on the left here and we move all the way across the target level and so for example let's say you're trying to become more dialogic you're moving trying to you know bring about more dialogue more more spoken language in lessons so, and I'm not gonna go into all of the details here. This is just to illustrate the tool. So you would come up with a target level of use and you'd think, you know, what's it gonna be like when this is working really, really well, when everybody, everybody's really learning through dialogue. And then you think, okay, so where are we now? And then you fill out the baseline. And so now we've got a sense of where we are and where we want to be. And then next we fill out the midpoint and we think, all right, what's it gonna look like when we're halfway on this journey? And so at this point, you might have some ideas a bit like these, these um, these ideas in the middle of the slide here. So we've now got a three point scale, but there's quite a big leap from E to C and then again from C to A. And so what we want to do is to split the difference again. First of all, looking at variation B, what's it gonna look like when we're almost there? And so you would think about what it's gonna look like when we're almost there. And then lastly, you come back to next steps. What's it gonna look like next week or next month or by Christmas or by Easter or whenever it might be? And so you come up with this with this scale. And once you've populated this table, it's a really good idea to leave it for a day or day or two and then come back and make sure that there's not too great a leap between any of these between any of these steps. Because if the leap from E to D is too is too high, 
then people aren't going to make the rest of that journey. So you want to make sure that there's a really smooth gradient going from E through to A. And this can be used as, as a very effective coaching tool. So let's say you observe somebody's lesson. You might say, well, you know, where would you say you are in that lesson? You know, how dialogic was that lesson? Were you at D? Were you at C? And so on. Where are you on a good day? Where are you on a bad day? Where are you on average, would you say at the moment? And where do you want to be by Christmas or by Easter? And what, what do you need to get there? Do you need to go and observe somebody? Do you need some instruction? Do you need to you know, read something to understand about how this thing works in practice? What is it that you need to move to the next level? Uh, and again, it can be used as a way to capture where people are in the way that we used with those, with those first two scales. And so here we can see the... Um, the, the genius really i think of this implementation bridge because when you get to the point where the majority of your colleagues are at the top end of the stages of concern scale likewise the levels of use scale and likewise moving towards the target level of use on the steps to success scale that's when you can say that you've got from where you are to where you want to be and so um yeah that's the implementation bridge it's a good one isn't it um so all that remains is to um is to, to just to wrap this up if i may i'm i'm very happy by the way to 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 remain on on the call if anybody has any questions um uh there's that link again if anybody wants to to get in touch um please feel free to to book a book a free call um if i could just flag a couple of things with you if you're interested in metacognition in in helping learners to become more reflective i'm running a one day workshop for senior leaders, for head teachers, senior leaders, thought leaders, really for anybody, anybody who's interested in metacognition. And I'm co-hosting this with a brilliant man called Roger Sutcliffe, who wrote a fantastic book called Thinking Moves A to Z, Metacognition Made Simple. This is on um, Friday, the 23rd of June, so Friday next week. Um, and if you want to use a to use that promo code, remit remet20, R-E-M-E-T 20, all uppercase you will get a 20 percent discount so please feel free to join us there are still a small number of places remaining on that course um it's an all-day thing and there's also the conference the rethinking education conference is going to be um held in, on saturday the 23rd of september at parliament hill school in north london um, the, we've got an amazing lineup of speakers, and this is for everybody in education. Young people are on the platforms, homeschoolers, unschoolers, mainstream educators, school leaders. We may even get a politician or two, who knows, um, policymakers, to all come together and to think about how we can, how we can bring about change, um, because clearly education isn't working for many young people currently. So if you want to come along to that, Saturday the 23rd of September, again, you can get a 20% discount if you use that promo code there, RE20FRIEND, again, all uppercase. Please feel free to, to use that promo code and come along. And hopefully, I just had a message from, from Karen. Uh, nice to see you there. I look forward to seeing you. So that's that. Here's some other stuff that, that we do at Rethinking Education. Um, the Making Change Stick course is one of them. We do a bunch of other things. If you're interested in any of that, please feel free to drop me a line. Um, via that website and um, yeah I'm happy to stay on the call if anybody has any questions if not thank you all very much for joining me I have very much enjoyed um, I, I could I talk about this stuff fun as you can probably tell if you have any questions ask away otherwise I'll see you again thank you Gavin I'm glad that you enjoyed it